compared to the complexities of the mental illnesses that we're studying. So the question is, how do we, how do we get there, and what do we do? Well, in my lab, we focus on one particular idea, and that is we're interested in biological markers of illness, but we're interested in that subset of biological markers that's, that, um, that share the genetic predisposition with the illness. In, in other words, an endophenotype. So what is an endophenotype? Well, we can kind of think about it and how the strategy works. So you have a conventional strategy versus an endophenotype strategy. So for a conventional study, you take something like schizophrenia and you go, uh, you take the diagnosis, schizophrenia, yes, no, you query the genome and you're done, right? In an endophenotype strategy, what you do is you start with, uh, you, you can start with something like a genetic variation, then you look at the genetic variation to its proteomic variation, to its cell signaling, to its, uh, to its uh, cell populations, to, uh, to, um, uh, to neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, to behaviors, um, and then all the way up to the notion of syndromes, right? Any point along this path, any measure could be considered an endophenotype, right? Because as long as you're going from a genetic effect to the behavior, anywhere along that pathway, you could consider something to be an endophenotype. And the entire point of this lecture today is to suggest that endophenotypes, if we choose them, will help us understand how, to, how we could get from the genetic variation to the behavior. That's, that's the whole idea. You can go home now. Um, but that's the whole idea of, of everything that we'll be discussing. All right, so what's an example into phenotype? Well, here's one. Um, the, this one I put in because we, I, we did it with a group from Karachi. Um, so we took uh, 709 individuals uh, from families that had uh, two, in, two siblings with bipolar disorder and we gave them all neurocognitive measures. And we wanted to ask one simple question. What neurocognitive me measures seem to be genetically correlated with bipolar disorder? And we came out with three measures, a, a digit symbol coding task, so a processing speed measure, an object delay response task, or a working memory measure, and a facial, uh, and a facial memory measure, so a, a declarative memory, a longer term memory measure. So these three tasks, if you are, uh, it, the closer you are genetically to an individual with bipolar disorder, the worse you perform, which suggests that there's pleiotropy between bipolar disorder and performance on these measures. Okay. The problem, though, or the challenge, as I like to say, is that the literature is replete with reports of putative endophenotypes. And not everybody in the world is as careful about defining endophenotypes as I might be about trying to say that there's a common genetic effect. So I was stuck. And the other problem is that multi-level hypothesis, that thing that goes from the genome to the proteome and so on and so forth, for most of neuroscience, it's too unconstrained. And you can, you can come up with whatever story you want to come up with. And I happen to be a reasonably good storyteller. So perhaps I could come up with things that are not constrained enough. And, and I, I could come up with a good story. And everybody would believe it, but it may not be actually advancing our knowledge. And then there was another problem, that there was no formal approach for evaluating endophenotypes. No way of saying this is a better endophenotype than that one. So in thinking about this, my genetics colleague and I, John Blangero, um, were sitting in a bar, because you know good science happens in bars. Um, and so we were sitting in a bar, and we were arguing about how do, we, how do we fix this problem? How do we find some way of conceptualizing an endophenotype that we can rank them? And we came up with this notion that the core issue of an endophenotype is joint genetic determination. So the same genes have to influence the phenotype and the endophenotype. And if you have that, then you can understand that what's really critical for an, an endophenotype is that it is heritable, and that it's genetically correlated with the illness or, it's or there's some evidence for pleiotropy. Okay, so what did this happen? Well, then John and I were discussing what you could do, and we came up with this particular equation. We actually wrote it on the napkin on the bar. So when you see two guys off on the side of the bar arguing frantically and writing stuff on napkins, sometimes they could be doing science. So. What do we come up with? We came up with this statistic, the ERV, or ERV statistics, the, the endophenotype ranking value. So the ERV 
measures the potential utility of an endophenotype for uh, a given illness. It is the square root of the heritability of the disorder, the square root of the heritability of the endophenotype multiplied by the absolute value of their genetic correlation. If you do this kind of work, all this is is a standardized genetic covariance. And all we're arguing is that if you maximize the standardized genetic covariance between an endophenotype and the illness, you have a better endophenotype. This, this approach, we named ERV, E-R-V, after this guy, Irving Gottesman, um, who coined the term endophenotype back in the, in the early 70s, um, and who was delighted that somebody named a statistic after him. Um, so the thing about this approach is that it is completely agnostic. It works for any heritable illness and any set of endophenotypes. Um, so what do we know about it? Well, it, the, the, like any covariance structure, it's going to go between 0 and 1, where higher values indicate stronger shared genetic influence. Very large numbers of endophenotypes can be assessed efficiently. Um, and it's applicable to all heritable diseases in, in, uh, that, that you could think of. OK, so now what we're going to do is have a couple of IRV in action uh, kind of examples. And one of them is uh, QTL localization for recurrent major depression. So what do we know about the genetics of major depression? Well, unlike autism and schizophrenia and, and to some extent, bipolar disorder, we've really had much less success in, in, uh, in learning about the genetic influences of major depression. There are a number of reasons for that. One of them is that, it's, uh, that it, it may be more common, and so there may be more heterogeneity within major depression. But recently, we had our first replicated GWAS hit for, for major depression, where, you took the, uh, where the, the group from Ken Kindler and Jonathan Flint and a large number of Chinese individuals went in and found 5,000 uh, 5, or so Chinese women with recurrent major depression and 5,000 or so controls and found two variants that seem to be different in those individuals with a recurrent major depression versus those that d don't have it. Um, this, again, just like the other GWAS effects, we don't have a gene and we're only explaining a tiny fraction of the effect. But this is brilliant because there are people in the genetics of depression literature who are arguing that we're never going to find anything. So the fact that it, it is possible to find something will work. The, the PGC, the Psychiatric Genetic Consortium uh, group, is currently working to have 100,000 individuals with depression and, uh, and 250,000 controls. Um, that's, that's the movement that they're going to. But that becomes a little bit odd, right? It's a very, very big sample, and there will be a lot of heterogeneity. Um, Jerome Green and colleagues uh, identified a QTL on chromosome 3, uh, 3P25 um, that was seemed to be associated with major depression, particularly among those that smoke a lot. Um, but causal genes remain to be identified. So we're going to, uh, we're going to use the IRV approach to look for genetic uh, genetics of major depression, or genetic influences of major depression. Um, we're going to uh, focus on recurrent major depression. We used endophenotype classes from the Genetics of Brain Structure and Function study. Uh, which we'll describe in a minute. But basically, we had 37 cognitive and behavioral measures. We had uh, 169 neuroanatomic measures, so gray and white matter measures. And we had about 11,000 lymphocyte-based transcripts. So the idea is as follows. With 37 measures, you could probably rate them yourself about which ones I think are more or less important for risk for major depression, right? Um, you might be able to do that with 169 neuroanatomic measures, but doing it with all 11,000 transcripts would be incredibly difficult. But we can do it with, uh, with this IRV approach, and this is where we're going to go um, from here. So the Genetics of Brain Structure and Function study is a study I've been doing for a little over 10 years now with my uh, genetic colleague, John Blangero. It's an extension of the San Antonio Family Study, which has in total about 3,000 people. To date, we've assessed 1,924 Mexican-Americans from about 50 randomly ascertained extended pedigrees. So the way we found these people was relatively simple. We took census tract information. We went to two poor neighborhoods in South San Antonio, and we asked two questions. One, are you Mexican-American? Um, the census track says that 80% uh, of the people living in these, in these neighborhoods were Mexican-American, so that was pretty easy. And the second question was, do you have at least four 
first degree relatives. And that also, considering that the, the average family size there was four children, um, is a relatively straightforward question. We recruited as many of those individuals from a particular family as we could. It was all done through telephones and modeling of census data. We tried to be as random about it as we could. Um, and, and at this point, we have genotyped all of them. 500 or so of them have whole exome sequencing, and all of them have whole genome sequence. Um, we have transcriptional profiling uh, from lymphocytes from multiple time points um, because we've been studying these people for quite a while. And the phenotypes we're thinking about today are structural and functional brain imaging, neurocognitive assessments, and psychiatric diagnoses. So you could be sitting there and thinking, this doesn't make any sense. If they're looking for genes that influence depression, why wouldn't they go out and find big families with lots of depression? Why would they use randomly ascertained in, uh, pedigrees? So the argument is that this sort of end of phenotype uh, and random ascertainment strategy has worked in other areas of genetics. There they may not call it an end of phenotype, they might call it a risk factor. But specifically, it's worked in heart disease and obesity and diabetes and hypertension and osteoporosis. There's no obvious reason it won't work in psychiatry. The issue is that you have to have, in the random population, enough people who have the illness. And with something like major depression, you are going to have that prevalence rate because there are enough people, if you randomly ascertain, that are going to have history of major depression. As a matter of fact, in our sample, in this particular set of analyses, we had 1,122 people. And of those, we had 215 individuals, or about 19% of our sample, that met criterion for lifetime major depression. Um, the major depression was diagnosed with a standard clinical interview, and then we had a consensus uh, diagnosis process. We had 86 individuals who were clinically depressed at the time of the sample, of the assessment. For all of the stuff I'll show you here, we included those 86 individuals, but we also ran analyses that excluded those 86 individuals, and the results are basically the same. Um, heritability for recurrent major depression in our sample was 0.46 which is reasonably strong. It's one of the reasons you're looking at recurrent major depression rather than just simply major depression because it, you, ha you have more certainty about the diagnosis and the heritability it tends to be a little bit strong, stronger. And this is consistent with what you see in the, uh, in the literature. And household uh, environmental effects were not significant uh, in this. So we tested both the household you grew up in and the household you live in now, and neither one of them fundamentally uh, influenced the, the, the heritability estimate for, uh, for major depression. Okay, so it looks like we have a genetic strain of major depression that we're seeing in these Mexican-American families. So what are the top 10 uh, end of phenotypes? Well, the top one is a transcript, RNF-123. So I'm betting you're sitting there thinking, that's the one I was gonna pick, right? Out of those 11,000, that was gonna be it, right? So we did, you know, 11,000 or so total measures, and we got that. Then the next one is also a transcript, PDXK. Uh, uh, the next one is the Beck Depression Inventory. So it's a symptom measure. But you could say, well, you can't have a symptom measure be an end of phenotype. And that's perhaps the, is true, except for the fact that our symptom measure was heritable at 0.25, meaning that how you performed on the, on the Beck ran in families, which is not surprising if you think about the way that, uh, that families work and the way that people interact with this. But it does take people a little bit of, to get their head around the idea that this type of index could, could, be, uh, could, could be heritable. In addition, we, we use the neuroticism questions that Ken Kindler is really excited about. Um, and that, that was also in our top 10. And the, neuro the Beck and the neuroticism are genetically correlated at about 0.9. So they're probably the same genetics that are reflecting both of them. We also got a brain region, the ventral diencephalon. And I'm sure you're sitting there thinking, what exactly is the ventral diencephalon? Because it's kind of an odd scenario. It is, um, it is the term used by uh, one of the free surfer atlases um, that is primarily composed of the hypothalamus. So you could say, ah, oh, that makes sense. The hypothalamus we know mediates uh, neuroendocrine uh, and neurovegetative functions that have been implicated in, in major depression. And we also know that if you lesion the hypothalamus in animals, you get something that looks like depression, right? But what we're suggesting here is that the volume of that region is associated with genetic liability for the illness. 
Um, so it's extending it beyond saying its current function is associated with current mediation. It's saying the liability effect is present. Okay. So back to that top ranked into phenotype, the RNF-123. Um, RNF-123, or sometimes called uh, KPC-1, encodes ring finger protein 123. It regulates neuroid outgrowth by the degeneration of the cyclic dependent kinase inhibitor P27 KIP-1. That's interesting to us because P27 KIP-1 is involved in increased hippocampal, hippocampal neuronal differentiation via glucocorticoid receptor with the administration of sertraline, right? So, okay. So we had 11,000 possible transcripts that we are measuring. We ranked them for their relevance for recurrent major depression. The one that was our best hit is directly related to the most commonly prescribed drug for the disorder. So it, it's not telling you we actually know what we've done, but it, it's the kind of evidence that makes you feel more comfortable about doing subsequent studies on RNF-123 and or the, the regions that seem to be associated with it. Um, we then used RNF-123 um, uh, and, and recurrent major depression in a combined linkage study and found a new, a new chromosomal point on uh, 4P15 that, ha uh, that suggested that that locus is harboring a gene or genes that influence risk for major depression and also influence RNF-123 levels. Now, the important point here is that RNF-123 uh, is not from this locus. It's actually uh, from chromosome 3, and this is on chromosome 4. So what, whatever we've, whatever's there can't be the, the, the cis regulation of that, of that transcript. It has to be some sort of trans regulation. Okay. So this brings us up to an interesting question, which is why would we study endophenotypes and illnesses simultaneously, right? Endophe psychiatric illnesses are polygenic and difficult on their own. Endophenotypes are undoubtedly polygenic and, and complicated on their own. But there are a couple of advantages that I'd like to bring out. One is that multi-trait analyses increase your power, both from, from, uh, synth uh, from data that has been, uh, that is, uh, you know, theoretically driven, as well as uh, there are a number of points of evidence from actual empirical data. Um, and it's possible that identifying uh, pleiotropic genes fo uh, focuses our biological inference, right? So if you think uh, this gene influences both RNF-123 and risk for major depression, you have beginnings of a pathway that gets you from the genetic component to the, bio to the biology. I like to think about it in this way, which is probably wrong, but I like to think about it this way because I'm relatively simple, um, which is that akin to, uh, it's akin to identifying overlapping community structures in complex networks, right? So there's this great paper by Paul uh, et al. from Nature in 2005. It's two Czech physicists who I am convinced wrote this paper while sitting in a cafe somewhere. But it's a paper mathematically modeling how when you have two complex networks, points of overlap can be seen fundamentally. This paper has been cited almost 10,000 times, and the reason is because it fundamentally solved a problem we had with how to improve cell phone uh, reception, right? But this type of math, this type of ability, I think is actually going to become very useful for us when we're trying to disentangle the complex genetic architectures of, of things like mental illnesses and endophenotypes. So I'll give you two examples of where we've done this in my lab. I'm sorry. The citations for all of these things seem to be down here, so you're just going to have to believe me that we've published them somewhere. Um, so one of them is as a pleiotropic locus on chromosome 18p11 for recurrent major depression and hippocampal volume. So this is an extension of the prior study that we did where we wanted to look at particularly the hippocampus because there's an association between hippocampal volume and, and major depression. It's the strongest association actually from neuroanatomy that we have thus far. Um, and we wanted to show, well, we saw a genetic correlation. It's a negative one, meaning the higher your likelihood of uh, risk for major depression, the smaller your hippocampal volume. And then we showed that, yes, you can find a locus that seems to be associated with it. Um, uh, we did a similar thing, looking at a pleiotropic locus on 4Q26 four, uh, on four for emotion regulation and amygdala volume. So neither one of these now is an, is, is an illness. It's just showing you that you can do exactly the same thing, which is to look for 
the genetic correlation between the brain region, the amygdala, which we know is involved in emotion, a regulation, and emotion uh, uh, identification, and an emotion identification task, so a behavior, and looking at the two of them and finding a locus on the genome that really has to be there because of the two traits are simultaneously adding to your signal. This, I, these kinds of approaches, I think, are really going to help us disentangle the complexities of the, of the underlying genetics of mental illness. So we have a question, though. Well, what if, what if you're interested in rarer diseases? What if you're interested in something like schizophrenia, which has a population prevalence of about 1%, although it varies between about 0.7 to about 1.5, depending on where in the world you happen to be? Um, but it would be difficult. And it would certainly be difficult if you're trying to use random pedigrees. So John Blangero and I were thinking about this problem as well. Um, and, and we came up with a solution. This is, I just put this up here to show that I could do math. That's really it. Uh, you don't have to pay much attention to it, but you know, it's okay. So the idea is as follows. If you have relatively rare disorders, can you find into phenotypes that are associated with those rare disorders by doing general population effects? So we argue that you can by rewriting your IRV statistic, now from being a variance component model to being a mean-based model. There are a number of points in this which really have to do uh, their assumptions about the underlying liability curve that's associated with the disorder, assuming that the disorder itself is not completely discrete. The reason, actually, I was really interested in this is a personal one. Um, I have a niece with an extremely rare genetic disorder. Um, it's actually been diagnosed 28 times in the US in the last three decades. Um, and what I wanted to know, it's, it's recessive, but we don't know the genes that affect it. And so I was thinking, is there some strategy that we could come to if there's a case where you're never going to have enough people to be able to look for this? And I was interested in seeing whether or not we could come up with a model. So in essence, what this model is doing is it's asking a kinship question. It's saying, we know what we're, what we're interested in now is not the individual with the illness. We're interested in all their relatives. And what we're basically asking is, as you become closer genetically to an individual with this disorder, does that change the end of phenotype in a way that you would predict given Mendelian mechanics? OK. Um, so. We went back to the uh, to the uh, to to our uh, gob sample, this genetics of brain structure and function sample, and we had six individuals that were diagnosed with schizophrenia in about 1,400 of the individuals at this point. Um, but those six people had we had 14 first degree relatives, 17 second degree relatives, and all the way up to seventh degree relatives. Right? So in total, there are 227 individuals who are, gen who are related to individuals with schizophrenia but were not schizophrenic themselves. And so the question is, can we see into phenotypes that vary in the patterns that we would expect given, this, uh, given these individuals? And we did. We ran this first on cognitive measures and we came up with three. Digit symbol processing, a, a processing speed measure, a facial memory measure, um, and an emotion discrimination task. All three of these have been implicated in as endophenotypes for schizophrenia previously, um, but we did it in this population-based sample, and we didn't include any of the patients. We excluded the six individuals with schizophrenia, so we're just looking at the family members. And then we came up with a number of, uh, of cognitive or uh, brain regions that were associated with it, particularly interrhinal cortex, parahippocampal gyrus, fusiform gyrus, precuneus, and superior frontal gyrus. In this case, we were looking at cortical surface area was the, was the trait that we were interested in. OK, so what this is suggesting is that, indeed, we can identify into phenotypes for, for relatively rare disorders in randomly ascertained population samples. Um, and now, I just wanted to throw this in because of conversations that Umberto and I have been having over the last two days about lipidomic variation and risk for bipolar disorder. So we're interested in lipids in psychiatry because lipids are in involved in lots of uh, basic processes that we're interested in. That 50% of the mass of the, of the brain by weight is lipid. Um, and that lipids uh, abnormalities have been identified in schizophrenia, autism, bipolar disorder, and recurrent major depression. And specifically, 
phospholipids are particularly strongly associated with risk for bi uh, with bipolar disorder, right? But what we don't know from this literature is, is any of this associated with genetic liability, right? Are these lipid effects simply due to the fact that the individual has the disorder or the individual is taking medications associated with this disorder or the individual happens to be overweight because of the medications they're taking from these disorders? So what we wanted to use is the same based, uh, mean-based ERV effect. So we had nine, nine bipolar individuals, 185 unrelated, uh, or unaffected relatives, and 373 unaffected, unrelated controls that we had full lipid data on. And what we did was we showed that there was uh, one of the, that, a, that there was a phospholipid that was well-ranked based on this uh, ERV-based test that was uh, significant after controlling for all the phospholipids that we were looking at, and that the particular phospholipid is, uh, is a potent inhibitor of the lithium uh, signaling pathway. Right? Lithium is one of the primary drugs used to treat bipolar disorder. So we were looking at this and saying, ah, this is, this is quite interesting and we would, it's, it's the kind of thing that we can begin to build on as you want to build on pathways that go from genome uh, to behavior. Um, this is the, the actual phospholipid that we're talking about, but I don't know how to pronounce it, so I'll just leave it there for you to read. Um, okay. So what if, we, what if we didn't want to start this way at all? What if what, what we wanted to do was say, okay, we actually have uh, an, uh, a behavior that we're interested in, right? So, for example, um, there, is, uh, there is working memory has been shown to be dys dysfunctional in schizophrenia for a long time. So we have uh, working memory is a schizophrenia in the phenotype. Here's actually another paper that that Umberto and I did together uh, once upon a time ago. This one was published in 2007, so you can see it right there. Um, and what we did was we showed that, that individuals with, in this case, uh, from families with at least two, indiv uh, two siblings with schizophrenia um, were significantly impaired on a, a, on a standard working memory measure. In this case, uh, we had 55 individuals with schizophrenia 40 un unaffected first degree relatives and 29 uh, uh, second degree relatives. And the zero line is the control line. And what you're showing is a huge effect. But the closer you become to an individual with schizophrenia genetically, the worse your performance on this working memory measure. Other working memory measures um, uh, has been, working memory has sort of been theoretically proposed as a uh, locus of dysfunction and psychosis for quite a while, particularly based on the work of Goldman, Rakich, and colleagues, um, that impairments in working memory uh, pr uh, exist prior to disease onset and are somewhat independent of the psychotic symptoms that the individual has at the time, and that family members have these effects. So we wanted to think about working memory uh, in, this, in this way, and what we did was we did a genetic um, principal components analysis. So we took all of the different cognitive measures we had in our GOB sample, and we calculated the genetic correlations between each one. And based on that, we came up with a set of factors. Just like if you're doing factor analysis normally, except that the inference now is that any two measures would be closer genetically rather than just phenotypically. And we came out with a set of factors like verbal memory, working memory, spatial memory, executive functions, and general cognitive ability. Um, all of these measures were highly heritable, um, and four of them, uh, are, uh, four of them were genetically associated with liability for schizophrenia in the sample using that mean-based test. So um, we've got this. Uh, we can show effects for this. And that one of these, like working memory here, has a very strong effect. Okay. Then I went back to those brain regions that were associated with liability previously, and I asked the qu following question. Is that working memory measure associated with liability for the disorder? And there, um, we found uh, that the working memory measure was phenotypically correlated with all of the brain regions. But genetically, it was only correlated with the inner rhinal cortex and the superior frontal gyrus, right? So what have we done? Well, we've taken schizophrenia, and we've shown that it's genetically associated with this working memory measure. And we've shown that these, genetic, these working memory measures are genetically associated with brain measures that we're also showing are associated with schizophrenia. So it's possible now that one particular gene or genetic locus could be influencing risk for schizophrenia, working memory performance, and this brain. 
uh, measure. That is allowing us to begin to, to piece together points along these measures that will allow us to go from the genetic variation to the behavior that we're interested in. Um, so I, I, I think for a number of reasons, we've kind of entered a new era, era in, uh, in psychiatric genetics. Specifically, we've got a lot of whole genome sequence data and it's coming along particularly well. Um, we're just in the beginning just like everybody else actually in whole genome sequence data to figure out exactly what we're going to do with it and how we're going to identify genes. Um, but we're getting there. We've, uh, we've got a lot of data elucidating the, the variation in the genome um, and we've begun to model common and rare variation relatively well. There are large scale collaborations that are moving us forward on common variation and some in rare variation. But I also would argue that endophenotypes are gonna end up being important for us to understand how we're gonna go from the genetic variation to the behavior, and particularly the different points along the way. Specifically, I think that endophenotypes will help us bridge the chasm between genotype and phenotype, because they'll help us uh, focus those multi-level multi hypotheses by saying, this seems to be along that same pathway, and we have to focus on this aspect of it because we've come up with a regularized rule-based method for seeing how a genetic locus could be influencing these different traits. Um, I, I've only been using uh, diagnostic criteria here. Um, we've been talking about schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, but really um, one of the things that the NIMH is pushing at the moment is this idea that rather than studying the classical diagnoses, we should be thinking about research frameworks um, or RDOC initiatives, so research diagnostic criteria initiatives um, that give us quantitative measures that index psychopathology. Those quantitative measures work exactly the same way um, in this framework as the illness measures that we've been looking at. Actually, they work better because they're quantitative measures, so you get a much better ranking uh, from them. I have a couple of examples of things that we've done with that. But at this point, you're probably thinking, my God, will this man shut up? So um, with that, I will say that I believe, and I've become fairly confident, that understanding the relationship between genetic variants that we might have identified um, and their relationship to endophenotypes will help us be able to bridge the chasm between the genetic variation and the behaviors or the, the disorders that we're, we want to study. They will also, in other ways, help us refine the way we define psychiatric disorders um, in, a, in a different fashion. And I'll, I'll show you that in a second. But I'd like to just acknowledge my colleagues. Um, there are a lot of them. The group, uh, the group at Yale, the group at the University of Texas at the Rio Grande, particularly John Blangero. Um, if you know John, he's a, he's a little bit larger and a little bit bolder than everybody else, so I, I made him that way in the slide. Um, and a large group of other individuals that we've worked with over, over the years. So I will leave you um, thinking just simply about the overall arching strategy that we're talking about here, which is identifying into phenotypes, using them to figure out genetic variations, uh, uh, identifying and sequencing uh, genes that may be helpful to understanding the illness themselves or the into phenotype, Studying, uh, in vitro, um, studying in vitro expression and function, possibly going to model systems depending on what we're looking for, elaborating our pathways and coming up with treatments. That then should go back to helping us understand what our, uh, what our diagnoses are and also what our endophenotypes are. And that is globally what I spend my time thinking about um, when I'm not thinking things like uh, what's my, what time is my flight to Mexico. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.